Hello, my name is Arab and I am a PhD student at the Active Adaptive Control Lab at MIT. Today I will be presenting my work on the optimal coordination of distributed energy resources in modern distribution grids, primarily for the application of Volfar optimization. In this picture, we follow the path of an electron in the electricity grid. We begin at large scale generators, travel through the high voltage transmission grid, and then enter into the distribution grid through a series of step down transformers into the secondary distribution feeder where customers like you and I are serviced. As shown here, end users can include residential homes which may have photovoltaics on their rooftop, electric vehicles in their garage, and smart appliances such as thermostats connected to local energy management systems. In 2017, these distributed energy resources or DERs contributed up to 46.4 gigawatts of potential capacity in the US grid. This is a huge amount and they can be leveraged to provide grid services. These resources, however, are located behind the meter. Let's take a look at what this means. The traditional electricity paradigm treats customers as fixed loads and large scale generators regulate their output to follow this load. These generators were typically coal and lar large natural gas fired power plants. With growing concerns over climate change and very ambitious renewable portfolio standards set by you, many US states, however, Renewable resources such as solar and wind farms have been added to the generation mix. And so we're still treating loads as fixed loads, but now we have more flexibility on the generation side. And these are large scale resources that can be controlled by the utility or system operator. However, as the cost of clean energy technologies continues to come down and there's a desire for energy autonomy, many end users like us are bringing DERs to the distribution side. Located behind the meter, these utilities have no uh, control or visibility over these DERs. This includes PV resources, which are intermittent and highly variable due to their weather dependence. To ensure the supply always meets demands, there is then, there is then the need for fast ramping devices. However, these are often very expensive. And so we look towards the flexible load paradigm where demand response resources can add an additional degree of freedom to system operators so that they can ensure that supply is able to meet demand while retaining the low cost of electricity that we are so used to. However, many small scale resources are, uh, exist within the distribution grid and they are spatially distributed. And so we must look towards control and optimization at the distribution level. In this work, we will consider distribution grids with high penetrations of DERs and consider the need for finer grain control of the voltage profile, both spatially and temporally. We propose the use of PV smart inverters and flexible loads coordinated through an optimization algorithm to provide this level of control. We also assume that in event of a fault, the protection scheme will take over. Now, remembering the resources that we had of the 46.4 gigawatts, distributed solar, which would include the PV panels we're looking at, consists about 44%. And demand response, which could include smart thermostats or other smart appliances, is about 18% of this entire uh, piece of the pie. Now, most power system models are designed for the transmission grid, which varies significantly from distribution grids. In the distribution grid, we have both mesh and radial topologies and are met with highly unbalanced networks because of the line characteristics and the presence of unbalanced flows. And so there is a need for improved power systems models. Secondly, the high penetration of DERs requires the coordination of a large number of intelligent and spatially distributed agents. To tackle this coordination problem and retain tractability and information privacy, we must then look towards distributed paradigms. In the rest of this presentation, I will go over these two building blocks, which include the power systems model and distributed optimization, and then leverage both of these in order to address the Voltvar optimization problem. We also present results for the IEEE 34 node network. We can begin by modeling the distribution grid. We take a current injection approach whereby the power injected P sub J and Q sub J at every node J is modeled by the current at that node I sub J. The rest of the model is characterized by the nodal voltage V sub J and then the current in the branch between nodes I and J, I sub I J. We consider both radial and mesh topologies and so a node may have a set of parent nodes which for node three for example is node two or a set of child nodes, which for node two is nodes three and four in this diagram. Finally, we modeled the line characteristics using the three phase impedance matrix, which consists of the resistance and the reactance components of the line. 
From our power systems model, we want a flexible model that is capable of describing the complete power physics for unbalanced and mesh networks, thus overcoming limitations of other power flow models which require balanced and radial networks. The model must account for active networks with high levels of power injection, and we also don't want any limitations on the optimization objective. Other power flow models often force the optimization problem to consider social welfare functions, which include a minimization of the line losses. However, this is challenging from a multi-objective point of view as the units of line losses and the units of other uh, terms, such as the cost of operation in dollars, don't match. Finally, simple linear constraints are preferred because they're much easier to and faster to solve, and the problem must be tractable in order for this to be realistically implemented. In order to meet these design goals, we introduced the current injection-based model. We look towards the rectangular representation of complex numbers to achieve simplicity and tractability. Constraint one models Kirchhoff's current law, constraint two is Ohm's law, and constraints three and four are the definitions of real and reactive power based on the voltage and current injection at that node. These constraints, however, are non-convex bilinear constraints, which we can convexify using McCormick envelopes. In the world of optimization, convexity ensures global optimality of the solution and can be seen of as something like the holy grail. The idea of the McCormick envelope is basically to use linear constraints, which we see here by the lines, to create a polytope, which is a shaded region, that completely encapsulates the nonlinear constraints, which is the black line. Now we want this polytope to be as small as possible, so it's as tight around the nonlinear constraint, um, and so we have a very tight relaxation, but we want this nonlinear constraint, nonlinear non-convex constraint to be contained within the polytope. For our technique, we are uh, relaxing both uh, equations three and four, and we, we require balance on both the real and the reactive components of nodal voltage and current. And we can determine these using the voltage magnitude bounds from the grid operator and forecast for power injection. Our proposed pre-processing emits a closed form solution and provides sufficiently tied bounds for the McCormick envelope. Further details are omitted due to time constraints. The complete CI model can then be written for the entire network and the McCormick envelopes are shown, uh, McCormick envelope constraints are presented in five to 12. In summary, we're able to achieve the design objectives on the left by looking at different features of the CI model presented on the right. We use three phase impedance matrix to model the lines and we rely on rectangular components and McCormick relaxation to render all linear constraints and the performance of the bounds depends on the tightness of the voltage and current bounds. And this depends on how well we know our system. With the closed form pre-processing, we can achieve tractability and low optimality gaps. And there are also no uh, constraints on the objective function. However, this model is still very, very large when we have a large number of nodes. And so we need to look towards distributed paradigms to realistically carry out network level optimization. To this end, we consider distributed optimization. For many dynamic, intermittent, and independent nodes located in our distribution grid, we must have an algorithm that can parallelize computations across the nodes, has limited communication requirements, and can preserve the privacy of sensitive data. We also don't want to rely on a central coordinator for any task. A common technique is atomization, where we take a large central problem and decompose it into smaller problems. The dependencies between agents are treated by using variable copies. And so we can take our larger problem, break it down into small problems, and we introduce these additional constraints. So these copies can be thought of, sorry, these copies can be thought of as uh, observers in traditional control theory. So here we have nodes one through four, and we have agent A representing node one, agent B representing two, and agent C representing nodes three and four. There's a dependence between agent A and agent C. And so we create this copy over here of this value. And then through communication and through these constraints, coordination constraints, we're able to drive the copies to the true value of the variable. Thus, each agent optimizes its own actions without violating a network level constraint. To introduce the algorithm, we first formed the Lagrangian by dualizing the feasibility and the coordination constraints, and so we have this Lagrangian. We can then employ gradient-based methods, such as here, to 
in order to converge to the global solution. However, gradient methods are typically slow and we have to use very small step sizes um, in order for the algorithm to be stable. To use larger step sizes, we can introduce regularization or proximal terms in order to bias towards the previous solution in the case of proximal terms. And this allows us to use larger step sizes. In our algorithm, we use the proximal term. And so here we introduce the proximal atomic coordination algorithm, also called PAC, which uses the proximal term shown in orange and additional regularization on the dual variables, the predictor corrector step. We can prove the linear convergence of the algorithm for strongly convex and strongly smooth functions, and the details are available in resource four listed at the bottom. We can then employ the PAC algorithm to solve the optimal powerful problem using the CI model. To do so, we must distribute the problem across agents. First, Ohm's law creates a coupling constraint on nodal voltages, and we treat this by creating copies of downstream voltages for every node. And so the child nodes, those voltages are copied for node J. The second uh, constraint, the KCL constraint, introduces coupling on the branch currents. We treat this by adding the downstream branch current to the state variable and creating copies of the upstream branch current for each node. Here we show the convergence profiles for the PAC on the IEEE 13 bus network. And we can show that the PAC achieves feasibility in this graph and that all copied variables equal their true value, which we see here as the distance to consistency goes down to zero. With these two tools in our toolbox, we can now solve the Volfar optimization problem by looking at the coordination of PV smart inverters and flexible loads. So as we discussed before, we will be considering things like smart thermostats and then the distributed solar. We carried out VVO on the IEEE 34 node network, which has low voltage issues, even though there are shunt capacitors in the network. We then run different test cases with varying penetration of DERs. Case B looks at uh, the baseline with a demand response. KC looks at the baseline with additional PV and smart inverters with, with variable power factor. And KD really tests the limits by looking at both of these resources together. We use load data from New England here in the Northeast United States to generate demand profiles for each node in the network. And finally, we consider three different types of objective, uh, objective functions. We consider a standard VVO to regulate the voltage about a desired set point for the real and imaginary parts. We consider minimization of line losses and we minimize the power imported from the main grid. Now we don't consider a multi-objective problem. Rather, our goal here is to look at how different objective functions result in different utilization of these DERs um, depending on different penetrations as well. While we also consider the time varying demand. And so the resulting voltage bounds are presented here. What we want to see with our DER coordination is we want to see this minimum voltage get pushed up above the acceptable lower bound of 0.9. We also want to see this average get pushed up to be closer to one per unit. The different test cases have varying DER penetration and different power factor for when the PV is available. For the case B of demand response, this, uh, this relates to 20 to 50% of the nodes having demand response uh, capabilities. For KC, this is 40% or 60% of the nodes having PV panels with a fixed power factor of one or minimum power factors of 0.95, 8, 9, and 9.5 again. And then KC combines these two resources with 40% PV or 60% PV and 20 or 50% demand response. Now, with our baseline test case, we see that the network without DERs exhibits low voltage problems, in, even though we have shunt capacitors. Using demand response, we can push this voltage up as seen, especially in the second case where we have a much higher voltage. However, we're looking at 50% of the nodes having demand response, and so this is high penetration, but really upwards of 50% to 80% of the load at these nodes can be curtailed at any point in time. In KC, we consider PV at varying penetration and varying power factor. And in this case, we see that because PV is not available at all hours of the day, we still have low voltage problems, which are seen here, especially when the sun isn't shining and the load is still high, say in the evenings. Finally, we can consider both of these resources and uh, really test our model and test our optimization to see what happens when we have a lot of these DERs present. We can definitely push the voltage up into acceptable ranges, and these are using more reasonable values for demand response, where only 10% to 30% of the curtailable load is um, 
is included, and this is resident, this is, sorry, reasonable for residential customers. Of these cases, the high demand response case in case C can support the voltage in the network to satisfactory levels. However, we can't realistically tell customers to curtail all of their load and sit in the dark for a few hours. And so what we really need is the coordination of different DERs to provide support through all hours of the day. And so we can also view this problem as a resource utilization and looking at these heat maps, which plot the fraction of each resource which is used at every hour of the day. PVs are marked from white to blue and demand response from white to red, with darker colors corresponding to higher resource utilization. For case three on the far left, we see that demand response is always used as we can easily boost the grid voltages by reducing the network load. For case four, we have two things. One, when we have a fixed power factor of one, meaning we only have real power, we're often curtailing our resources as shown by the white. However, we can, when we can vary the power factor and bring it down lower to a 0.9, for example, we're able to inject reactive power and so our PV is always used. In these last two plots, we're looking at the case five where we have both demand response and PV, and we see that the objective function really changes how these resources are utilized. Um, and this is shown by the varying colors in this map. So all of this talk on resource utilization really boils down to demand response, sorry, uh, demand response units and PV resources providing services to the grid. Demand response units are reducing their consumption at times of high load or low volt, uh, load generation. PV units are either supplying energy locally or injecting reactive power in order to boost the voltage. And these different services must be translated into a financial compensation for DERs. Namely, there needs to be market derivatives in order to correspond to grid services. However, given the spatial distribution of DERs and the highly temporal nature of the grid services that these DERs provide, the coordination of financial compensation for DERs can only be done through local retail markets at the distribution level. We present and propose one such market structure. Finally, we also need um, to have market settlements through temporal and spatially varying uh, prices, and so we term these distribution level locational marginal prices. We leverage the pack as an underlying algorithm, and this makes the decisions and settles the uh, bilateral agreements between the agents in the market. We also need a cyber framework upon which these DERs can be coordinated and the retail market can be uh, run. We have started to tackle this problem as well. To summarize, in this work, we carry out volt bar optimization in the distribution grid using PV smart inverters and flexible loads. We leverage a current injection approach to model unbalanced and mesh grids and make use of distributed optimization to maintain tractability. Future work will extend to include storage using multi-period optimization and the full integration of these market derivatives for voltage and reactive power supports into the proposed retail market structure. Additional references are provided here on this slide. I thank you for your time and attention and for your interest in our work. I'll be happy to take questions during the conference and by email as well. Thank you.